Yes. Can we add, I don't know if it's called an input mask, so the name is only like uh, alpha instead of numeric. Well, um, we are, uh, we'll look at some of the things that, uh, some of the other validations that you can do. In addition to the built-in validations, there is sort of a wild card validation that, that you can write your own custom validation if it doesn't fit into any of those categories. All right. So the answer is kind of like, yeah, you know, because worst case scenario, you know, to almost any validation question you'd ask, because um, the validation controls are very robust in that it validates most of the things that you'd expect to want to be able to validate. All right. However, um, if it doesn't, you can always write your own validation and, and create sort of a custom validation uh, role. Yes? Can you put more than one validator on a field? Yes. In fact, uh, we'll do that in the next example. We'll add age and we'll add a required field validator and we'll also enter a um, maybe a range validator. All right. Um, that will, that will check to make sure it's within a certain allowable range. Um, nice thing about these controls is that um, <coughs> they work both in client and server mode. All right. If you remember, let's carry this through. Let's think this through. We have our diagram where the client requests a page, travels around the internet, makes it to the appropriate web server, and the server responds with the page. The page consisting of some combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, let's think about form validation. All right? Form validation, things like making sure that required fields are entered, that if it's supposed to be a number, it is a number. If it's supposed to be an age, it's within a range of, of, of reasonable ages, and so on. All right? If we think about it, if the validation happened on the server, and only the server, that would be a potentially frustrating experience for the user. Because if the user entered in a form, and it had to travel all the way through the internet, hit the server, let the server try to process the form data, come up with an error, and then return a result that says, oh, you forgot to put the name in. All right? There could be potentially a little bit of time delay between the time the user clicks the submit button and the time that they get their response saying that there's an error with the form. All right? And that's annoying to the user. It's annoying to the server, too, if we want to personify it, right? Because if you have an order that doesn't have a credit card number or doesn't have a name or an address, or any of those details associated with it, then a server can't pro possibly process that order correctly. It's doomed. So you're giving it form data that it can't process. And it's obvious that it can't process it. It's not like some subtle check that's done. All right? It's a no-brainer. In other words, it doesn't take a great deal of, of brains, so to speak, to look and say, hey, I can't process this order because it doesn't have a name. I can't process this order because it doesn't have a credit card, and so on down the line. That's a very simplistic form of validation. Even more involved validation, like it's within the range of 0 to 100 or whatever. It's not particularly complicated validation. So you don't require some supercomputer to do that. You don't require great resources. The client on this end is a computer as well, right? If we give it the code to do that processing, it can do that validation, all right? And then it becomes a win-win situation. 
It's a win situation from the client because the client will get immediate feedback. All right. They try to valid. They they try to um, uh, process a form. They click the submit on the form for an order, and they forgot their credit card number. The client side JavaScript validates that, and boom, pops up a message saying, "Hey, you didn't enter a credit card number." This code on this machine is going to run virtually instantaneously, at least compared to taking the round trip through the internet to the web server and back. So it's a benefit to the um, client because a client gets an immediate response. You know, if you're going to get bad news, it's better that you get it right away than have to sit there 15 seconds and then, ah, sorry, we can't process your order. All right. It's a benefit from the server too because if certain basic information is entered in almost any sort of form, then a the server can't really do anything with it. Right? If you try to enter an order and you don't put in a name or address or credit card, the server can't process that order. So why bother the server with stuff that, that's doomed, all right, that isn't going to work? So it's a win from the client because the client gets an immediate response. It's a win for the server because the server isn't bothered processing garbage data. Now, typically, well, uh, go ahead. Um, do you still have to put validation checks on the server, I mean, is there a possibility that in that transit through the internet or, or well, let, you could get bad data? Let, let's talk about that. All right. Let's talk about that. The typical kind of validation that happens on the client are the kind of simplistic no-brainer validations that I'm talking about. Are the fields entered? Is the data within a range? And blah, 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 so on and so forth. All right. Very simplistic, doesn't require extensive resources. For example, doesn't require looking up in the database to see if there's something in a field. Doesn't require looking up in a database to see if something is a valid integer between 0 and 120. Doesn't require any special resources. So what could happen on the client side? right? Remember, all the database interactivity and complicated stuff we want to have happen on the server side. All right? but this kind of validation isn't like that. It would be like if you went in a uh, went to apply for a job, all right, and you go in and you ask the uh, receptionist for a job application, all right, and you filled it out and you gave it back to the receptionist, and the receptionist looks at it, might look at it, might look at the other side and say, "Hey, you forgot to fill out box E, or you forgot to sign it, or you forgot to date it, or something like that." That doesn't require great human resources skill on the part of the receptionist. The receptionist is just looking at a very simplistic, it, are all the things that so, are supposed to be entered on that form been entered? Yes or no? If no, you give it back. All right. Could you imagine the frustration if the receptionist just blindly accepted it and gave it to the HR person, and then the HR person is reviewing the application, going through, trying to process it and determine if this is a good employee, then gets to the box on the other side that, that you forgot to fill out. All right. For one thing, you're probably already back home. All right. They're annoyed because they're trying to process an application and they can't because it's missing information. And they would go, uh, you know, and, and, and it's, it's a lose-lose situation for everyone concerned. All right. Now, that's part of validating form data, is doing this sort of mechanical, does it meet certain criteria? All right? But there's more to that. There's more to form validation than that, right? Because I have to have a credit card to place an order, right? Does that mean if I just put in my credit card number as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that it's going to work? I hope not. Well, actually, I hope that it would. The company that I'm trying to purchase from would hope that it wouldn't work, right? Now, that's a different kind of validation, right? That's a more extensive validation. That's a validation that takes some brains, if you will, and takes some um, resources that the client won't necessarily have. For example, 
if I put in a credit card order uh, and I put in my credit card number, the server might go and look, and first of all, there's rules about how credit card numbers are constructed, right? I don't know all of them, but you know, it could, if you typed in 15 zeros, that's not a valid credit card number, all right? Now, it's possible you could build that rule in the client, but you might not, all right? But more so than that, you might want to contact the bank that issued the credit card to see if that credit card has been reported stolen, to make sure that the name on the credit card matches the name that was supplied with the order, all right? To make sure that that credit card um, is authorized for the purchase of that much, and it's not like, um, you know, it's not like over its limit or being declined because they're, they're late paying their bill or whatever, all right? So that's more work. The client doesn't have the resources to do that, all right? The server does. So there can be two levels of validation, all right? The very basic cursory glance at the data to see if the data is good or looks good, all right? Follow some basic rules. That can be done on the client. Then the data gets shipped to the server, and the more extensive validation can be done on the server side. Yeah, they entered a credit card number. Yes, yeah, the right number of characters. No, there aren't any letters in the credit card number. Those are all things that the, that the, the client could do. Is that credit card for the person who said it's for? Is that credit card been reported stolen? Is that credit card behind in its payments? Is that credit card above its limit? That requires the server talking to some other resource to, to find out. Um, and therefore, that can't be done on the client. Just like the receptionist, all right, um, you know, may look to see, um, you know, that you filled in all the blanks that you need to, but isn't going to go uh, and look through and see, hmm, you know, they put down as their college, you know, what's a lot of you from the old Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons or anything like that, right? They're not going to go in depth. They're not going to validate the references, the receptionist. You they know. can't decide if you're qualified for the job. Either. Can't see if you're qualified for the job, yeah. The more extensive validation um, or like even like gaps in, the, in, in your work history or anything like that, you know. Um, that requires the skill and the resources. The receptionist can follow basic rules and say, yep, yeah, everything's entered, nope, it isn't. But to, to do more extensive validation of that, all right, requires additional references and additional, I guess, knowledge about the problem. And in form validation, it's the same thing. There's two levels of validation, or there can be two levels of validation. The mechanical, does the data look like it's good data? And then more extensive validation that requires other resources, other knowledge. There's another monkey wrench in the situation, all right? That is, the user can turn off client-side scripting. I'm, I'm, yeah, client-side scripting, that's not what CSS means here. That's just an unfortunate coincidence. <laughs> User can turn off JavaScript. What does that mean? That means that your brilliantly written JavaScript to validate that form won't run in that client's browser. It just won't. All right. Click on the button. Doesn't do what it's supposed to. Now, what do you do in cases like that? Well, you are likely to have redundant validation on the server, which was kind of getting back to your original question, that does the same validation of the client, uh, the same, does the same validation that the client was going to do. All right? Now, what if they don't have JavaScript enabled? What if they have JavaScript enabled? Well, we'll do the validation on the client, then we'll repeat it again on the server. Yeah, so what? It's not, these kind of checks, you know, don't take any time at all, virtually. So, the fact that it does a redundant validation, eh, no big deal. All right? No big deal at all. But if they have JavaScript disabled, then at least those controls are running on the server. So that's what the .NET controls provide for you, by the way. If you were not using the .NET platform, if you were using some other platform, you would have to build redundant validation in your JavaScript 
as well as in your server side code. But the .NET controls take care of that for you. The, 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 the .NET uh, validation controls run both on the client and on the server. Um, if you don't believe me, go and disable JavaScript on, on a browser and run a test and you'll see the validation still works even though you have disabled JavaScript. Now most people don't disable JavaScript, right? But it would sort of be a shame if all someone had to do to defraud some company would be to turn off their JavaScript and submit uh, an order without a credit card number, right? That would, that would kind of be unfortunate, all right? Not exactly skilled hacking, right? Okay. So I won't demonstrate it, but again, you can verify it if you want, but trust me that these controls fire off in both places, all right? In addition, we could add some extra validation if our validation required something like looking up items on the database or whatever. You know, Think of entering in a password somewhere. The client can make sure that we've entered in a username and password, right? But we don't want the client, and it would be impossible or impractical for the client, uh, or undesirable even, for the client code to look and make sure that that was a valid user ID and password. That's something we want to have happen on the server. All right. Back to this. So we have our form with the name on it. Let's go and add a text box for age. So I'll just go copy this here list of item. Now we have a text box for age. And I'll go in and I'll add a required field validator for that. Say what control am I validating? TXT age. Give it a name. And then give the text that I want up here if there's an error. So I pretty much did the same thing with this as I did with, with the other one. Nope. All right. So now if we go and do this, must enter name, must enter age. And you can even notice, by the way, that this is running client side. You can sort of guess that. Because if I go in and hit the submit form, you can tell it's not resubmitting the page. The status doesn't change to indicate it's being refreshed or anything like that. Whereas if I do this, it doesn't show much because we're running on a development server on this machine, but you can see it's a little green bar going across the page and the page flickers a little bit and so on. So you can tell that if, if there's an error that JavaScript is catching that error and causing the page not to submit, all right? Whereas if, if the data is correct, then um, it, it does go to the server and it could be processed. Now, the processing involved isn't anything earth-shattering, right? The processing is simply that, you know, it, it's redisplaying the page. But we can add some processing logic to this um, subsequently. All right, but a text box is just that, a text box. 
which means that the required field validator simply looks to make sure that we've entered something in there. It doesn't make sure that the, the numbers are, that, that it's a number as opposed to a string or that it's within a valid range or anything like that. All right? A text box is simply a text box. To ensure that a text box fits some further rules, like it's only a number or that it's within a certain valid range, you have to add another sort of validation. All right? So let's look at that one. It's a range validator. I'll go and put that there. Actually, for this one, because I can't off the top of my head remember all the properties, I'm going to go to design view and use a property window. All right, click on that. Look at the properties of that. And I can go in and I can set the different properties. Error message, I could say something like age must be between 0 and 125. We'll be optimistic. <laughs> What's the oldest person ever lived? 120? Maybe? We still have a control to validate, right? Because what has to be within 0 to 120? The name? No. The age. So I picked to say that I want to validate the text age. Then I have to put the maximum and minimum value. Now, notice that the way this is designed, these properties are in alphabetical order. So the maximum actually appears uh, above the minimum. So. I make that mistake, you know, once a semester, uh, but today's not the day. So some other time in the semester, I'll probably put that in wrong. So I'll go and put in the maximum of 125 and the minimum of, 100, of zero. The other thing I have to do is I have to specify the type of data for that range to work. All right. Remember, the, the collating sequence, the sequence that things appear in, depend on whether you're talking about a number or a string, right? Because numbers are compared based on their numeric value, right? In other words, 20 is between 0 and 100, right? Well, yeah, 20 numerically is between 0 and 100. If, however, you misidentify a field, and you say it's a string when actually it's a number, a different sequence kicks in. And that is, you use the sort of alphabetical like you have items in the dictionary order. Whereas you look at the first character and see is it greater than the first character, or do the first characters match? Uh, or is one greater than the other? Is the second character match? Or is it one greater than another? And in that scenario, 20 would not be between 0 and 100, right? Because the upper end is 1, 0, 0, and the first character of 2 is greater than the first character of 1 and 100, and therefore, if it's treated as a string, 2, 0 is going to be greater than 1, 0, 0. So that's obviously not what we want to have happen with age. We want these to be treated like numbers. So we'll go in and we'll put in the type of... You can either put integer or double. Integer is, you know, with no decimals, double is with decimals. So I can go and run this now, and when I run it, if I don't put anything in, I get those ages, or those validations. If I put in something that's outside of the range, I got the other validation error. If I put something within the range, then it works. 
Now, one thing you might have noticed is my error messages sort of are staggered. In other words, I don't put anything in the message appears here. If I put a garbage value in, the message goes over here. There's a property we can go and set on the validation to make it work better. Let's go and see what that property is. I don't remember. Display. I believe the display is dynamic. We'll do it. Now we can go and run this and notice those, those um, error messages then appear in the same place for both, both types of dynamic? Display is dynamic as opposed to static. Static means it's positioned there. Uh, essentially, static says that that error message is going to take up space whether it's displayed or not. Dynamic says it's not going to take up space if it's not displayed, so the other one will, will can slide alongside uh, inside of it. So the, the, the property is called display and the values are dynamic and static? Yes. Did you have to set that on? Did you change that property for the first error, first validation or the second validation? I changed it on both. Oh, on both. Could I only change one? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll bet I could get by only changing the first, but I'm not going to risk tempt fate. Now, it's not uncommon for there to be a couple validations. All right, controls. That allows you to configure things the way they need to. For example, you might say, well, gee, couldn't I just put a range validator and be done with it and not bother putting a required field validator? Nope. All right. Why not? Well, it doesn't work that way. All right. If you're more curious about why it doesn't work that way, it makes sense. Let's say age is an optional field. All right. Let's say age is a field that you don't have to fill in. In other words, an empty entry is legitimate. All right. So that means that it can't be required. All right. Let's say, however, if they do enter that in, it has to be between 0 and 125. So they can't put garbage in. They can skip the question if they want. But if they enter the question, or if they answer the question, they have to give a, a legitimate answer. So it's just easier to give these little validation controls that each do their one job than try to make a mega validation control that does like several things all at once. All right. That's a typical sort of thing that's done in software engineering. Rather than trying to write a giant monstrosity that you can configure a million different ways, it'll just give people several little components. And OK, you have to put two validation controls. All right, that's better than wrestling with one giant validation control. Um, let's look at some of the other validation controls that are available. And we'll just talk about them, and you can explore them on your own. And you can see how they're relevant for um, your next assignment. All right. Oops. I'm going to close this. Ah. There is a compare validator that allows you to compare two controls together, two controls with each other. So I have two text boxes. I could compare their values. All right. Why would I? Why might I want to do that? Why might I want to compare the values of two text? Yeah. Uh, if you have a confirmed password. Yeah, confirmed password. password is one. You want to compare the values of the two text fields. Make sure the password A matches password B. Dates. Dates. Let's say you had a starting date and an ending date. All right. You don't want this, the ending date to be um, before the starting date. All right. So therefore, you put a control that would say, hey, the ending date has to be equal to or greater than the starting date. You know, Any sort of time you'd enter a range in, um, 
you, you would want to validate that. So that's a compare validator. In the compare